Okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, <clears throat> we've been in business, uh, I'll give you just a short history. We've been in business about 20 plus years. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the sales were pretty slow and we couldn't sell a tool unless it had a handle on it. Uh, today, uh, the tools look uh, quite a bit different and uh, they're, they're used by many of the professional turners out there. Anything from, uh, you know, the brand new turner to the uh, highly qualified uh, uh, wood turner. Uh, we uh, private label a lot of tools. Uh, we private label tools for uh, Mike uh, Joukowsky, Lyle Jameson, Trent Bosch. Uh, you know, the list kind of goes on. And uh, anybody that's doing hollowing on a, a professional basis, safe to say <clears throat> that we've got the tools available for hollowing. So uh, the tools are all made in Minnesota. The, there, there's three components. There's a shaft, a cutter, and then the handle. <clears throat> so the, uh, the shaft is all manufactured in uh, Ramsey, Minnesota. The cutters come out of Chicago. Uh, the wood uh, for the handles, that's purchased from a, um, a woodcutter just north of uh, La Crosse. And then uh, uh, Jeff down in Shakopee, he does all the assembly. So all orders come in to Jeff and then he uh, puts it all together and ships it out. Uh, you know, this, this stuff is just it's sold all over. I'm, I'm humbled and... Uh, uh, appreciate the sales that we've had. There's uh, distribution in uh, Belgium, Norway, England, uh, <clears throat> Japan, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, so, you know, all that stuff, uh, Austria is another big one. Uh, uh, you know, all that stuff is just going the right way that we're actually providing made in the USA product. So this morning, I'm going to start out by making a uh, Christmas ornament and um, this uh, ornament globe, I did this um, a couple days ago. This one is out of uh, uh, Osage, Orange, Osage Orange, I believe. But it's more of a, a, a squash design. It's not a true sphere. Uh, and I like this for a Christmas ornament globe. Um, you know, the finial and the icicle. Uh, blend in very well with this. So that's the first thing that we're going to turn. And we'll send this around. Okay. So <clears throat> let me just leave that up there. And I need my helmet. Where's that? <clears throat> so the first tool we're going to use. <clears throat> is what I call the uh, stabilizer. And this tool is built on a uh, 3 8 uh, thick shank, uh, about an inch and a quarter wide, and it uses a small number one cutter. Does that show up? And, and it's in the right spot for you to see. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we call it the stabilizer because uh, let's just say you're doing some hollowing like on a box. You know, the deeper you go, the stronger this tool gets. The further you go over the tool rest, uh, the more the thicker the steel is that's out there. So this was developed uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, you, you know, I'm always playing with tools. And I'm, I'm having a tendency now to use this one more so than the, than the Viceroy tool. But, you know, the world goes around and things will change. Let me, I was going to find a piece of tape here, put it over my pocket, or actually what I can do is just take this off and put my turning smock on. It's right there, that gray one. Yeah, just put that, should have had that ready to go. Okay. So 
So to use this tool, just lay it on the rest. Basically, basically what I want to do What I'm looking for right now is just to get this round and about a two inch diameter, which is roughly the equivalent of that uh, globe that's going around. I think we're close enough there. So I'm going to start shaping the, the front of the ornament. So whether that's the top or the bottom of the ornament globe, uh, you know, you really don't know till it's done. Like you're well below center, is that intentional? Um, yeah, I was, uh, the tool is about 3 sixteenths or 3 eighths thick, and then I was, uh, had the handle down. So I'm, I'm actually starting to ride the bevel on the cutter for surface finish. And safety's sake, you're supposed to turn the lathe off every time you make an adjustment here. So I'm going to go back roughly uh, about an inch and a, inch and a quarter. And uh, another tool you can use <clears throat> is what I call the uh, Viceroy. Now the Viceroy and the Stabilizer are basically, they are the same exact geometry. They use a number one cutter. The cutter is set at a front tilt of about 30 degrees and it's got a little bit of a side tilt uh, to the left. And then both these tools, you see that little step right there? Does that show up on the camera? Uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that's your maximum depth of cut that you can take with that tool. So uh, it kind of controls how much depth of cut and makes it a relatively easy tool to, to use. So I'm just going to do a rough shape. Okay. That is correct. Uh, that's the difference on my tools. Uh, mine actually cut versus scrape. So uh, just like a, uh, a positive rake scraper, or oh, you just give that to anybody that wants that. Uh, 
the tools actually uh, uh, set up a, a sure cut. They're, in a, they're set down in a negative rake. In fact, this is a good time to uh, cover that portion of it. All of my tools, you have to run in a, uh, in a tilt angle. So say for example, uh, those that do any kind of resin work, you've probably watched uh, uh, Jim Sprague with, uh, you know, on his uh, wood turning videos with resin. This is the Hercules tool that he does, he uses quite a bit in his resin work. But uh, you note how that cutter has got a front tilt of about 30 degrees. This is what we call the, um, the Badger series. And this cutter does not have any tilt on it. So when you're hollowing, you actually have to turn it and put a 45, roughly a 45 degree angle, anywhere between 30 and 60 really. But uh, you know, it's gotta have some tilt angle on it. If you run it like this, this thing will self feed on you and you'll put that out in the backyard, give it a rest and never see it again, you know? And then, uh, <clears throat> let's see, my line is, uh, my line is still there. Um, <clears throat> When you're hollowing with these tools, you know, a lot of times you can't see where you're at down there, you know, in, in when you're hollowing. So, and people have said, well, you should put a line down there. And anytime you do another operation, you know, it's another 10 bucks and people don't want to pay for that. Uh, where the simple solution is put a dot or a, uh, a mark on the ferrule of your tool. Uh, that's, you know, it does, doesn't cost anything that way. So let's drill a hole. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna be real precise on this. I'm just gonna go down. Uh, about that deep. And like any drill, you need to back it out a little bit. Is that gotta stop? Okay. So, <clears throat> To turn an ornament, there are two tools that we're going to use. <clears throat> I've drilled a hole down to, in theory, what would be the bottom, inside bottom of my ornament. We'll start out <clears throat> hollowing with the uh, number one taper straight tool and we'll open that up as much as possible. And then we'll take what we call the back tool. Some people call this a shoulder tool, but you can see how that cutter is angled right straight back. And uh, that will get underneath the, uh, the drilled hole. And in this example, we've got a 5 8 drilled hole. And let me grab one piece. <clears throat> This is an example of how to uh, turn a Christmas ornament. So <clears throat> we'll start out, you know, we've got it fairly round or, you know, in our form. We'll drill a hole. We'll take the straight tool, open it up as much, much as possible. Then we'll take one of the bent tools and start opening it up, you know, down in the belly area. And then we'll take the, uh, what we call the back tool and start working in this area. And all the time, you know, you're, you're constantly going back and forth between all three tools, uh, 
you know, getting your wall thickness down to where you need, need to be. So we'll send that around. And when you're, when that goes around, just leave it on the back table over there. <clears throat> now I've left quite a bit of thickness on the, uh, on the back side, mainly because, uh, you know, I've had two of the ornament globe break off. Uh, I think we've all experienced that one time or another. So we'll go down and find the bottom and it's down there somewhere. So Most mistakes on Halloween, uh, any kind of an ornament or any kind of hollow form are right here, is getting the tool in and getting the tool out. That's where that 5 eighths diameter sometimes becomes the uh, one, inch, one inch diameter. But I'm hollowing back to the front. front down to the back and pretty soon we run out of room and let me find a gauge here We'll send these around when we're done here, but this is a set of gauges that uh, Johnny Tolly, he's out of uh, Austin, Texas makes. And uh, feel free to uh, mark down his phone number and give him a call for the, uh, for the gauges. So when we're done, after I'm done with the globe, I'll, I'll send it around. But you can measure your, you know, your wall thickness at the various locations. So we still got quite a bit of material to come out. So I'm going to switch to the back tool and I need a, is there a compressor here? Or, well, I've got a straw here somewhere. Here, let me get a, here, this will work right here. <clears throat> So I'm going to back the uh, rest up a little bit because when you're hollowing, you don't want to hollow on the hook. That induces torque, uh, you know, for the uh, for the cutter to uh, uh, fall down or to uh, torque on you. Whereas if you keep it on the shaft, uh, then you're cutting right in line with everything, and it uh, minimizes any issues that you have. So let's see what we got here. So now we're starting to get down there.
Oop. That's what I said about uh, making the hole larger. When I'm inside, uh, a lot of times I'm going from back to front and then front to back, so it's kind of a, a sweep both ways. Um, <clears throat> now, on this particular tool, <clears throat> if you have an ornament globe, let's just say uh, two to two and a quarter inch in diameter, which is roughly what this is, with a 5 8 drilled hole. This is a three quarter inch radius. As long as you keep everything parallel with the ways, if you do the math, it's impossible to go through the sidewall. But a lot of us can kind of do one of these things or open the hole up a little bit. And, <laughs> you know, it certainly is fairly easy to go through the sidewall. So here's a sweep from the back towards the front. I'll take the uh, straight tool, do a little more on the back. And I'm, by sticking my finger in there, I, I can feel I didn't drill that very deep. Let me <clears throat> drill that out a little bit more. And if you could put those back in there and then just send those around and anybody that wants to know where those gauges come from, um, feel free to just call Johnny himself. Okay. Okay, that's more like what it should be. Yeah. And I'm just going to make one cut here. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll be using it again here, so. Well, let's just go ahead and cut it off here and see what we got. Well, 
Okay, so for right now, I've got that cutoff area or parting area under 5 eighths. So hopefully the globe should just fall right on there. Okay, so there we are. Now, you know, obviously we didn't do any finished cuts and no, no additional shaping on the back side. But by the time we uh, shape everything, sh you know, by the time if we shape the back side, uh, do some sanding, I think we would have our uh, uh, wall thickness just about where we wanted it. And Jerry, that's a set of tools that you have, isn't it? Uh, that is correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I bought a set of those from him, and then I had to loan them back to him. Yeah. <laughs> No. <clears throat> yeah, the question was, do my cutter heads fit on other tools? And the answer on that is no. Um, <clears throat> a lot of tools and, uh, you know, not to, where'd, where'd Ed go with his tool that he brought? Yeah, Ed's got one uh, tool that he brought and it's, uh, in fact, if you, if you don't mind, Ed, I'll just uh, tee that up. That's a good example. <clears throat> Here's a tool that uh, Ed has made, and it works. Um, but it's actually just sitting on top of a piece of steel. So, you know, depending on how you're cutting with that, it does have a potential to unwind. Whereas with mine, let's get one of the bigger ones. See how the cutter is enclosed in a pocket? So <clears throat> all cutters, uh, my cutters, there's, there's four different sizes um, and they're actually in millimeters, but the number one cutter is six, number two cutter is uh, eight millimeter, number three cutter is 10 millimeter, and then there's a uh, 12 millimeter, which is the number four. And this looks like, that's the number three cutter. <clears throat> yeah. So it's the exact same cutter as we have here, but you know the cutter is held on with a torque screw, which this one is. So the torque screw uh, has a taper on it, which matches the taper on the cutter. So that's one self-locking me mechanism you have. And then the second self-lock is the cutter actually sits in a pocket area. So that helps um, you know lock the cutter in place. When I used it, I did have a did you? Yeah. Okay, and that's exactly why. So the, a little bit of a reusable Loctite seemed to help. It, so. Okay, yeah. I'm not a big fan of Loctite. People have asked about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, whatever works really is the way to go. It hasn't come off since I put it on. Okay, all right. But it hasn't come off at all, so I don't know. When I take it off to replace it, I may be, uh, <laughs> yeah, you may be regretting what I did. Yeah. All right, so let's switch gears and... Uh, We'll uh, go to a uh, Richard Raffin style of box. And what we're going to turn is, Ed, if you could hand me uh, the box. Uh, both, if you would, please. <clears throat> we're going to turn a uh, Richard Raffin style of box. 
Uh, this is from some uh, old growth fir. Uh, it could be pine, we're not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, the story on this wood, it came from a, a friend of mine. Um, <clears throat> Lives in his grandfather's house. The grandfather built the uh, the garage back in the 1920s, and the wood was cut up from uh, uh, railroads, <laughs> and uh, so he cut it down to two by fours or two by eights, whatever. So that's what we're gonna what we're gonna attempt to uh, demo here today. But it's uh, just a nice, uh, simple uh, raffin style of box, and I sent Ed a PDF on uh, you know the process. So, um, you know, use that with discretion. Uh, it's probably got some copyright issues to it, but uh, I think if you use it with discretion, it was published in, where was it? Wood Magazine, I think, uh, back in 1980 something. So, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the process is the same. Uh, this is a uh, street taco warming bowl. Uh, so a street taco will fit right in there and you can keep them warm. <clears throat> now, if you wanted to uh, make, make like a uh, rice bowl, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times in a rice bowl, you, you see the curved bottom and the curved top. You can do the same thing, it's the same process. Uh, it's just a matter of how you change the form on the outside. So, <clears throat> Let's see now, how do we lock? Let's see, could you hold this down while I lock this in? You need a third hand. This is where you do need the third hand. I think that's tight. Okay. So once we get into, uh, get the thing turned around and get into the hollowing process, if anybody wants to do any hollowing, uh, <clears throat> I'll take a chair and you can come up and do the hollowing. So start out with, you know, we want to get it round. And I'm running uh, about 1100 RPM. And let there be light. Yeah, every piece helps. Okay. So we're pretty round. Um, now there's a finish, but let me see if I can improve that. I'm going to drop the handle. And ride the bevel on the cutter. And that should help, yeah, and it does. It helps improve the uh, surface finish. That's not our final finish yet, but 
And the tool I'm using is uh, what we call the Viceroy. center. There's uh, 1190 RPM. A couple of my uh, recommendations on these tools is it's always hard to tell when these cutters get dull. And uh, for me, you know, it's always the uh, fingernail test. So running my fingernail across that, I can feel that this tool is, uh, it really doesn't grab my fingernail like a new tool would. So I can feel this tool is starting to get dull and due to be rotated. So. My recommendation is uh, whenever you're done turning for the day, always just do a random rotation with the cutter. And when the part starts to fuzz up all the way around, then assume it's dull all the way and then you're time for a new cutter. People ask how long the cutters last <clears throat> and uh, I really don't have a good answer for you on that. It all depends on uh, did you hit a nail, did you hit a stone? Um, <clears throat> I like to go down to SWAT, the uh, Southwest Wood Turners Association uh, meeting every year uh, down in Texas. And they're always turning a lot of uh, mesquite and pecan down there. And uh, you know, it's got a lot of sand and grit in there. So you sell a tool to a guy one, you know, one year and you see him the next year and uh, he hasn't rotated it at all. Uh, and he calls himself an average turner. So to me, an average turner is going to be in the shop, I don't know, three times a week, four times a week, maybe two hours at a time. Uh, and if he's still using that same tool, same radius, same everything, hasn't done anything to it at all. Uh, one year later, turning mesquite and pecan, uh, that's not bad on, on tool life. So, uh, <clears throat> You know, I often I get a uh, an order from people, uh, from customers uh, that buy one tool and a half a dozen cutters. And, uh, you know, that half a dozen cutters is probably a, a two lifetime supply. <laughs> you know, it's a guy by the name of Jim Sprague up in Canada. He does a lot of uh, resin impregnated wood up there. And, um, you know, he claims that, uh, you know, the tool life is incredible with him. I, I um, he hasn't bought any cutters probably in six months, maybe even longer than that. Uh, but, uh, and you know, he, he, po he posts a new video every week with, uh, with resin work. So it's just hard to say how long they do last. So anyways, I'm a big believer in a negative rake cutter or a negative rake uh, scraper. Negative rake scrapers were always kind of uh, taboo, but uh, they've, they've gained favor in the wood turning market now. So a negative rake scraper is basically just a skew, and that's all what my, my scrapers are, just uh, 
uh, in this case, most of them turn out to be uh, uh, Doug Thompson skews. Uh, <clears throat> and then on the grind, you know, you've, you've got your top grind and then your bottom grind. So if you, uh, <clears throat> uh, the last grind being the, on the bottom, there's your little burr right there on top uh, for, for finishing. Uh, whatever angle my grinder is set at, I, I don't, <laughs> they're all different. <laughs> um, about uh, six months ago, I did go with a uh, CBN wheel. So now they're all getting to be about the same. But, uh, you know, I, sometimes I, I turn it over and I kind of clean it up on the top. And then when I uh, uh, grind down the bottom, that's where I put my burr on. So let me take a little bit out of the bottom here. Okay, then I'll just take uh, <clears throat> my negative rake scraper, clean this up. So you can see that sharp, it's throwing those little curlies up. Take a little more off of the outside. Let's just see where we're at. That's actually pretty good. Main thing is, uh, you know, it's going to sit flat on the table. Now, right here is where my undercut is going to be for the uh, jaws. Um, <clears throat> I like to use the uh, the Nova jaws because of the uh, the dovetail on it. So I'm going to put a dovetail in right here. And since it's a demo item, I'll uh, have a little bit larger on the on the dove, dovetail. But uh, like the ones that are going around, you know, I had a fairly small dovetail, so it's it's amazing how small a dovetail you need. I'm not going to do any sanding or anything, but uh, now if I could get you to hold it again. Yep. Yeah, we're going to put it in a different chuck now. Hopefully, we're going to put it in a different chuck. Okay, we'll take this one off. Yeah, I need a straight one here. Or a chuck wrench. Come on, muscles. Got it? All right. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, you thought you was good for oh, uh, not that one. Thank you, Ed. All right, where's? <laughs> This is just based on my experience um, <clears throat> using chucks in the expansion mode. It seems like they, you can take a part off and put it back on in the expansion mode and uh, it always comes back to where it tracks pretty even versus like on a tendon, uh, <clears throat> if you take it out of the, out of the chuck and then you'll, you'll never have that thing track as as even as it would be in the expansion. So let's just get this back to being round again. Okay, so the raffin box has got a little taper on the outside, which is what I just put on. And uh, for the beads, I like to use <clears throat> these, uh, let's see, I guess it's D-Way and uh, Sorby. Uh, anybody else make beading tools at all that you're aware of? That's the two that I'm aware of anyways. And these are uh, D-Way beading tools. So in this case, I'm going to use a uh, quarter inch, and then I'll put in a 3 16 So to do, to do a bead, bring the RPM down to around 400, so there's 388, uh, oh, there's 450. So it's left, then right, left, And just a little bit more to have it completely round. Left and right, so. So we've got a bead in there that's uh, the quarter inch bead. And that's cut fairly clean.
Okay, I'm take this down just a little bit on the outside diameter. So it's the same process. We're at uh, 450 RPM. Go left, then right. Left. Right. And we've got our beads in there. Anybody have any questions so far? Anything we're doing? So when you're saying uh, left and right, your uh, hand is going left and right. Correct. Right. Yeah, I'm just rotating. And you're pivoting on the tip. Pivoting on the tip. That's the right way to say it. So I'm uh, left. And then right, so you know, I'm, I'm not plunging in with the uh, beading tool, but I'm cutting on the left side, turning over, cutting on the right side. And then eventually, you know, you do have one cut where you're right, you know, you're right down the middle to, to, to complete the cut. So let's clean this up a little bit down here. Drill a hole. Okay. So the hollowing process actually goes fairly quick. Now this could be a bowl, could be a platter, <clears throat> uh, a box, <clears throat> an urn, uh, you know, whatever hollow form you, you have. Um, but it's an open hollow form. So I drilled a hole down the middle. Uh, 
RPMs, uh, well, right now we're 1028. There's 1093, so call that 1100. Get the tool on center. So who wants to come up and do some hollowing? Anybody want to try it? Sure. <laughs> okay. Does the uh, grain orientation affect the tool presentation at all? No. <laughs> So whether it's end grain or side grain, it doesn't, doesn't matter. make any difference. Right now we're working on uh, side grain, so. And this tool we're using the stabilizer. But we'll go from outside towards the inside. Here's another tool. You can try this one if you want. Let's get. No. This is this is the viceroy. Might have to adjust the center height on that. It's a little thicker tool, but. Uh, Here, let's back this tailstock up a little bit and give you. Okay, let me, uh, so let's just say this was an urn. Oh. Else want to try? Yeah, anybody else want to try it? Okay, let me show you another way to hollow. This is with the, uh, thank you, Ed, the badger tool. That's not bad finish in there, you know. It, uh, <laughs> So this is what we call the badger tool. Now the badger, um, you know, this tool, if this was a, uh, uh, more like a closed hollow form, like a, uh, a vase or something where you're reaching down in there, um, that's what this tool would be for. So let's just pretend, you know, we're reaching down about uh, five, six inches. see here thank you it would probably help if I had a sharp, that one doesn't grab my fingernail at all. So, another way to hollow, <clears throat> let's just say we had a uh, undercut. And let me put an undercut in there.
Okay. So let's just say we're in a uh, southwest hollow form, or we want to get un underneath the you know the shoulders of a hollow form. This is what we call the uh, the badger spun neck, and that'll reach around underneath to uh, do some hollowing, you know, on, the, on those shoulders. Uh huh. The, the reason it didn't work for me, but it worked okay for you, was the angle. Right. That forty-five degree angle that I didn't put on my on your tool because it's already set on the head for a different. Angle. Correct. Correct. Um, also, when you're hollowing, uh, myself, I like small cutters, uh, especially for hollowing operations. Uh, smaller cutters have less surface area engaged with the wood. So as a result, um, it's an easier tool to control. And when you get a catch, it's going to be less horrendous because you can control that, uh, control that catch. Uh, whereas with that larger cutter, it's got more surface area engaged with the wood. So as a result, <clears throat> um, when you uh, get a catch, it's going to be more horrendous. And then also, uh, everything has a trade-off. Smaller cutters give you a, a not as good surface finish. Larger cutters give you a better surface finish. Unless you're Mike Mahoney or Trent Bosch, and I've seen those guys use these tools, and you know they start with 400 or 420 on, on their sanding. So <clears throat> Trent Bosch, uh, he buys a lot of these. You know, he private labels tools, and uh, his business, him and uh, Lyle, uh, Lyle Jameson and Trent Bosch especially. Uh, both of them, uh, I don't know who buys more, but uh, they've got a lot of hollowing tools out there. That was the Viceroy. We'll go back to the stabilizer. And I'm not going to take these to a finished dimension.
So, <clears throat> this would be, and I'm going to take this home and finish it. I'm not going to take it anymore, but this would be the bottom, uh, the, bo the bowl of the box. So, excuse me? Um, <clears throat> when I started to come up to the side, I caught the uh, the edge of it here. So let me uh, uh, let's see here. We'll put that chuck back on. Uh, oh, we're, okay. Probably another half hour. 20 minutes? Okay. Um, well, let me ask, what kind of questions do we have? Okay. Um, let me ask, the question is, what's the best tool to buy to start out with? And uh, what's your skill level? Are you comfortable? Medium? Um, are you comfortable with bowl gouges? Yeah, I'm a bowl maker. Okay. Uh, what kind of lathe do you have? I have uh, a Luna. Uh, 18 or 18.30? Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> that's what I have as a Laguna, 1835 or 36, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, it's a good machine. And uh, I like to turn boxes, but, you know, we all uh, start out by turning the bigger bowls. Um, so I would go with either the stabilizer or the Viceroy tool to start out with. It's a, uh, just a good general purpose tool that you can use for outside work and inside turning. Now, if you're um, comfortable with a bowl gouge, there's a tool we call the Osprey. And let me just, uh, let's just stick this on and we'll just make some cuts and not work on the top at all. Yeah, anybody want to come up and just make some cuts with... Okay. Let me get it back. To... Okay, let me get it round. Yep. Mm. 
Okay. Here you go. Want the smock on? No. Nope. So what are we going to try to do? Uh, yeah, you want to do on the outside or you want to do some hollowing on the... Okay. okay. Try it. Okay. Is this cool? This is what we call the stabilizer. Let's use two tools. Let's use both the stabilizer and then uh, we'll come back in with the Viceroy. And I think you'll find that they both perform about the same. So this is got the other cutter right? So I don't have to like with my tools? Nope. Mm -mm. Okay, that's kind of why I raise it a little bit, but don't try it here. Might be a little bit. You're a little high there. I want you to drop it a little. Right at center. With the tool level. Mm -hmm. Got this little edge here. I think I had a turn that was catching that edge right there. Yeah, so you really want to. <clears throat> like that. Right. Straight on. Go straight in yeah. and then go from uh, left to right, and that'll be your maximum depth of cut right there. So that's how much depth of cut you can take at one time. There's the Viceroy. You can see the cut, it's going to be about the same. This one just sticks out a little more? Um, <clears throat> the only difference is the, it's a half inch square shank versus three eighths thickness. Uh -huh. Thickness. That was wrong. No. Okay, this thickness? Thickness. Okay. <laughs> this particular one, uh, we sell the Woodcraft, and uh, they do a lot of bowl turning classes with this one. Yeah. And uh, we also use a lot of, uh, or work with the uh, uh, the veter veterans associations up there, and uh, the bowl turning they, they do with this this viceroy tool. Uh, another one you could use, um, this is what we call the Osprey. This is just like a bowl gouge. You anchor, bevel, and cut. So <clears throat> you can see what kind of finish you get there. It's uh, just a nice smooth finish. So if you're turning a, um, you know, say a spindle, you want to get from point A to point B and you just want a cutter that's not going to get dull on you, uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, Osprey is a good, good way to go. People that do segmenting, uh, a lot of segmenters use this tool because they build up two or three rows or layers and then, uh, uh, you know, they go back in and touch the, uh, you know, do the, uh, get them back to being even, and then don't want to touch them again. And that's what they do use with this tool. So, uh, what else do we want to see? Anybody else got any questions? It is. Mm -hmm. Right. There's two sizes on this tool. Uh, most of the segmenters use the number two size. And then as far as uh, payment, uh, there's a price list on there, and we'll take credit cards, cash. Uh, <clears throat> cash is always king. Uh, one time out in North Dakota, I had to wait till he, he got paid on his crops, but uh, so. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> he does want American money, by the way. Yeah, American money. I can't cash some euros. I'd have to go out to the car and get them, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? 
hopefully uh, this is what you were looking for. I wasn't quite sure what you were looking for, but uh, um, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of the typical demo that I do. So just kind of run through the tools. Uh, does anybody do any coring? There was one person interested in coring. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we've got a uh, cutting tip for the uh, one-way coring uh, back there. Uh, that cutting tip's $190. <clears throat> and when I uh, first came out with that uh, cutting tip, uh, I didn't think it would sell for, you know, trying to sell a cutting tip for 190 bucks. But, you know, you got a lot of manufacturing costs in it, and that's what you got to have. So, uh, you know, when you come out with a new tool, I've got four or five friends that I always just kind of spread it around, just to make sure it's the right tool and doesn't go on the wall of shame. Um, <clears throat> anyways, you know, $190 for the tool, you're buying just one more tool. And after that, the repetitive carbide is uh, $29. And, uh, you know, for coring, uh, people always complain about the, the one-way coring tool the cutter itself you, you know it's just hard to sharpen and keep sharp and uh, a lot of times they're they're taking it off even during the core to resharpen it uh, whereas <clears throat> with this uh, core pro we call it uh, people are getting 40 50 60 cores per edge then you flip it over and you got another you know 50 or 60 cores per edge uh, for 29 bucks, you know, you've got, uh, you know, over 100 cores. Uh, a guy like uh, Glenn Lucas, he uses it. Just throw a name out there. And, uh, you know, his typical lot, and this is green wood, uh, is 120 cores or 120 bowls. That's his typical order. And he does the whole lot with uh, the Core Pro. Uh, doesn't change it, doesn't flip it, nothing. Uh, but he knows what he's doing, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? Any more questions? Okay, all right. <clears throat>